So good morning. Uh, we have been looking through uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, as you know this term. Oh, uh, originally, this would have been one book, um, a whole, one scroll, the whole of Ezra and Nehemiah, covering about 100 years of Israel's history. And we've been jumping around, uh, looking at different themes rather than kind of following the story through. And as you'll see, you've got return, rebuild, and renew. And at various times, there were various groups that returned from exile to Jerusalem. Um, we've read about various bits of rebuilding. They rebuilt the temple, they rebuilt uh, the walls. Um, and we've had a little look at renewing, but that's what we're going to be focusing um, a little bit more on today. So if I can have my next slide. Um, I don't want to spoil the end of the story uh, or to spoil what's going to happen in our final session on, on Ezra and Nehemiah, which is in two weeks' time. Um, but the renewing doesn't necessarily go particularly well, and that might not come as much of a surprise. Next slide, please. Uh, today, uh, we're thinking about repentance, confession, and covenant. If you've got a term card in front of you, or at home, or if you've gone on the, uh, the church website and you've gone Sunday at CBC, services at CBC, scroll down to current series and turned your phone on its side, uh, you will know that uh, today we could have been looking at Ezra 9, Ezra 10, Nehemiah 9, or Nehemiah uh, 10. Uh, we've just read, as has been obvious, we've just read Ezra chapter 9, and that's the only uh, part we're mainly going to kind of focus on today. Uh, this isn't the first time the people have had to repent of their sins, and surprise, surprise, it won't be the last time. Next slide. Um, it's a bit um, like this sin cycle that we have as we kind of gone back to almost since the book of Judges, and even before then, where the people sin and no sooner than God rescues them and everything's okay again, they turn their backs on God and they go their own way. And I'm sure that this is something that many of us can identify with uh, within our own lives as we seek to to follow Jesus. We find ourselves in this loop where we keep on doing things that we don't want to do. By the time um, Ezra gets to Jerusalem uh, at the end of chapter 8, the people, as you'll see from this timeline that we've seen a few times, they've been back in the land. Some of them have been back in the land for 80 years. The temple has been completed for nearly 60 years. And today's passage only really makes sense when we read it within its larger context. Um, and um, Ezra was a Bible nerd, and so Ezra would have known all about the larger content, uh, the larger context. Um, and it's one of the reasons why it's taken us nine years to get to Ezra and Nehemiah is because we think it's important that we are aware of something of that bigger story. In the book of Deuteronomy, uh, the people, they'd already been rescued from slavery because of their sin. They'd spent 40 years wandering around in the desert, and now finally they are at the borders of the promised land. And so Moses is talking to this new generation, the ones that have survived the wilderness, talking to this new generation who are about to go in they're about to take possession of the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. And he reminds them of the terms of the covenant that their parents made with God at Mount Sinai. They are about to drive out uh, those who live in the land. Or God is about to drive out those who live in the land. And God says, have absolutely nothing to do with them. You need to be totally separate from the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, all those people that we heard about earlier on. And God specifically said to them, do not intermarry with them. Not because God is a racist, but because he knows that these other nations will end up leading his people away from him and worshipping false gods. They will teach them to do things that God doesn't want them to do. Because God wants his people 
to be separate. He wants them to be different. He wants them to be holy. He wants them to be his. He wants everyone else to look at God's people and think, wow, if that's what it looks like to, be, to serve the living God, to be in a relationship with the living God, then I want some of that. Of course, tragically, throughout the whole of the Bible story so far. And remember that Ezra and Nehemiah is kind of pretty much right at the end of the, of the Hebrew Bible. So that in kind of the whole of that Old Testament story so far, the opposite has been true. So rather than be different and stand out, the people have looked at everyone else and said, we want to be just like them. And that's why in 722 BC, uh, Israel was taken into exile by Assyria, and why in 586 BC, Judah was taken into exile by the Babylonians. That's why the temple had been destroyed. That's why the walls had been knocked down. God had promised them this land. He'd driven the inhabitants out. But he'd also warned them that if they behave just like the people who were already in that land behave, then they too would be driven out. And that's exactly what happened. And that's why Ezra has grown up in Babylon, hundreds of miles from the city he longed to call home. And finally, Ezra is getting to visit Jerusalem, a place he's only ever heard about, a place he's only ever read about. As he's poured over his Hebrew Bible, as he's read about Jerusalem in the time of David, in the time of Solomon, as he's dreamt about being able to offer sacrifices in the temple, finally he arrives in Jerusalem. And almost immediately he is confronted with the fact that the people are committing exactly the same sins that landed them in this mess in the first place. They are still being unfaithful to their faithful God. I wonder if this is a position that we ever find ourselves in. Being in a place where we're doing those things that we've already told God that we would never do again. And the good news is, is that in spite of all this, there is still hope. And there is still hope because what happens next relies more on God than it does on us. Ezra's response is one of genuine sorrow and shame. Uh, if you've got children, or if you've worked in a school context, then you probably found yourself in a situation where you've got two children who need to say sorry to each other. Neither of them is remotely sorry for what they have done. But they know that the only way they are going to get out of the situation they are in is by saying sorry to each other. And so they initially do it through gritted teeth. Then they're told to say it as if they mean it. <laughs> and they say it, but of course everyone knows they don't mean it. And so there is this sense that we, we learn from quite an early age that saying sorry is something that we can do in order to get out of trouble even if we don't mean it. But of course, God knows our hearts. There is a saying amongst football fans, it's the hope that kills you. you know, Ezra was a Bible nerd. And so Ezra knew the Old Testament story, a story that is full of false dawns. Hopes raised and then hopes dashed. This sense of, this is it. This time, God is finally going to rescue his people, and then time and time again, his people mess it up. And so as Ezra, as he returned to Jerusalem, or as he came to Jerusalem for the first time, he would have had this incredible sense of hope and joy and optimism. Surely, this is the time. This is the moment. The people this time 
surely we're going to learn from our mistakes. This time, we're going to get it right. We're going to live in obedience to God. We're going to break this sin cycle, and the kingdom of God is going to be ushered in. Now, there was probably someone in that group of exiles returning uh, with Ezra from Babylon to, to Jerusalem that came up with an annoying little song um, in Hebrew. They kept humming it or singing it the whole way. Uh, months on end as they traveled from Babylon to Jerusalem, a song which roughly translates to, we're coming home, we're coming home, <laughs> Israel's coming home. And so Ezra's sorrow, it's, it's almost crushing. I mean, as you read about his response to what he hears, when he learns what the people have been up to, his heart is absolutely broken. And I think for us, all too often, saying sorry to God can be more about getting us out of trouble than a genuine heartfelt response for what we have done. One of the reasons that we celebrate communion is because God knows that we are a forgetful people. And he wants to keep on bringing us back to the cross. He wants us to know, yes, how much he loves us. But he also wants us to remember how serious sin is. He wants us to remember that our forgiveness cost Jesus his life. Because sin separates us from God. And it is only through Jesus' death on the cross where he took our sin on himself. It's only through the cross that we can know forgiveness and new life. Jesus loved me so much. Jesus loves you so much that he was prepared to die on a cross so that we might go free. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes prayers of confession can be a little bit like Sorry for everything I've done wrong today. Amen. Um, but here we see that Ezra is very specific in naming their sin. He acknowledges God's law. He acknowledges that God said, you are not to intermarry with these people. You are not to make a treaty with them. And he confesses, this is exactly what we have done. He specifically names their sin. And one of the dangers of trying to live modern day life at 100 miles an hour is that there is very little time to pause and to meditate and to reflect. There's no time to think back over the day or to think back over yesterday to thank God for what he's been doing, but also to name those things that we got wrong. To name them, to bring them to God to say that we are sorry, to be specific. Things that I've done that I shouldn't have done, to specifically name it. Things that I've not done that I should have done. But as well as naming their sin and confessing their sin, there is also repentance, and we see this in chapter 10. The people resolve that they're going to change their behavior. They resolve to end these mixed marriages. Uh, marriages which should have never happened in the first place. They're once again, they're going to separate themselves away from their neighbors. Let me just remind you again that just because something is written in the, in the Bible, it doesn't mean that we should do it. Uh, so here, every Israelite who was married to a non-Israelite is going to send their foreign wives and their foreign children away. And there's a list of them. Uh, there's the list of the people that did that at the end of Ezra chapter 10. And so is the application of this passage that every Christian who is married to a non-Christian needs to end that marriage and to send their wives and their children away? Well, of course, no. That was inconsistent with the reading and the understanding of the rest of scripture. But it is a reminder to us that God does call his people to be separate. He calls us to be holy. He calls us to be different in the way that we live, in the way that we think, 
in our values. We will be different to those that we live next door to, those that we work with. And when we identify sin in our lives, when we confess that sin, we need to take, uh, we need to put steps in place that will mean that we won't sin in that way again. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus reminds his disciples of the seriousness of sin and the drastic but not literal steps that he would prepare, he would expect us to take, or we should be prepared to take in order to guard against sin. And so if, you're, if you know that you're kind of trapped in this sin cycle, but you know that there are certain triggers or there are certain contexts that lead you into that cycle, then how can we avoid those triggers? What steps can we take to make sure that we avoid those contexts? What steps do we take? What measures do we need to put in place so that we're not putting ourselves in those positions in the first place? But most importantly, and this is where the good news is, uh, we're not relying on ourselves. We are, we are relying on God's goodness. We're relying on his grace, his mercy, and his love. You know, Ezra acknowledges that even the punishment that they've experienced from God, in that God has been gracious because they deserved so much more. He's not treated them as their sins deserve. They deserve to be wiped off the face of the earth, and yet God preserved a remnant. And now they've been brought back into the land. And God doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. But he has promised to forgive us when we confess our sin. You know, we might be unfaithful, but God is faithful. As Ezra read through the story and the history of of Israel. It's a story of false dawns and dashed hopes as the people mess it up over and over again. But it's also a story of God's faithfulness, a story of God walking alongside his people, not letting them go, a story of new beginnings. And of course, most importantly, it's a story that points to Jesus. It's a story that points to Christmas. But that's a story for two weeks' time. Let's pray.